Welcome everyone, and we are celebrating AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and we appreciate you all being here tonight. Um, we have a lot of events coming up for AAPI Month, and I will put a link in the chat momentarily with a link to all the events. All right, announcements, library announcements. Have you heard the main library opened yesterday? Woo so exciting. And if you haven't seen the video on Twitter going around of uh, the opening and our staff applauding our patrons as they came in, it's a little bit of a, it might, well, it was tearjerker for me a little bit. I don't know about for others, but yeah, so good to see the folks fill up the, the atrium of our beautiful library. And there's no date set, but we are going to be opening other locations soon. So stay tuned for that. And of course we have our library to go locations. We wanna welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and acknowledge the many Ramitush Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards of the lands in which we work and reside in our beautiful Bay Area. The library is committed to uplifting the names of these lands and community members from the nations with whom we live. The link that I put in the chat box has a link to some resources and reading lists about indigenous culture and land rights. Um, and if you know what native land you are joining us from, you can put that in the chat. And if you don't know, there's a map called nativeland.ca, which will tell you what land you are occupying. Uh, the library, one thing I'm, many things I'm proud about, about working at the library, but mostly we are not a neutral institution and our library stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. And um, we are um, deeply hurt by the violence targeting Asian and Asian Americans that has been occurring. And um, not just in our community in San Francisco, but nationwide and we stand in solidarity with our neighbors and colleagues distressed and hurt by these attacks. Uh, these are all anti-Black, anti-Asian racism, both uphold white supremacy and everyone is harmed by these racial structures. The library has been working hard on our racial equity commitment and you can find that in the link that I put on or if you just Googled SFPL and racial equity, you would find all of the work we've been doing. All right, announcements. Okay, here we go. Don't forget to wear that mask when you come to our libraries, please, and all over town. It's not over. And just protect everyone who's working for us and serving us in the streets. Tomorrow night, author Mariel Luong will be launching a book launch party and bringing poets with her. So come check this out tomorrow, 6 p.m. And this is a partnership with Kearney Street Workshop. So come check this out and support our poets. On Friday, Mr. Martin Yan, and he is super fun. And every time we're like, how is he gonna cook three things in one hour? But he nails it, he is such a pro, he's amazing. On Saturday, we have two events, starting with Tresse, a graphic novel, sorry. Uh, a graphic novel writer and uh, artist will be here. And they're joining us from Holland and from the Philippines. So some silver linings of graphic, of shelter in places. We get to bring all these people to our virtual library. And this graphic novel has just been optioned for Netflix. And you can check it out at your local library. And then same day at 3 p.m., we have an artist panel, Art as a Vehicle for Social and Political Change. And this one is hosted by our Eureka Valley branch. <clears throat> and I'll breeze through these, but do know we have a lot going on for AAPI month and I will put that link into the box. Writers, I know you're here tonight because you love writers. So we have an author panel, a mystery author panel. Um, not AAPI, but in May, um, author Lewis Gordon uh, talking about his latest book, Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization. And we're celebrating the amazing Aaliyah Bowles and her book, Home Baked, My Mom, Marijuana, and the Stoning of San Francisco. And super fun book, but also packed with history, rich history of San Francisco, and that great time period and era 
um, mixing humor, stoning, and the AIDS epidemic. So there's tragedy and humor combined. And this is part of Total SF, which is Peter Hartlob and Heather Knight's uh, podcast and happenings. And they'll be joining us quarterly, so check it out. On the same page is a bi-monthly read, sometimes monthly, depending on how we're running in this shelter-in-place world. But uh, May, we're celebrating author Vanessa Hua, who's also a journalist for The Chronicle, and her book, A River of Stars, also very San Francisco. And right now, you'll be able to find all of these books extra books. We have extra copies of these books, so you could check them out right now from our library. Um, if you don't follow Chinatown Pretty on Instagram, I suggest you do. They are the best, the most stylish and wise seniors across six Chinatowns across um, America and Canada, Vancouver. All right, and now without further ado, we have Alka Joshi, who has written The Henna Artist and um, has an upcoming book, The Secret Keeper of Jaipur, which will be out in June. Um, Alka Joshi is a New York Times bestselling author of The Henna Artist, a graduate from Stanford University. Uh, she received her MFA from the California College of Arts and has worked as an advertising copywriter and marketing consultant and an illustrator. Alka was born in India, in the state of Rajasthan. Her family came to the United States when she was nine. She now lives just neighbors, we're neighbors, on the California Monterey Peninsula with her husband and bad dogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, without further ado, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Alka Joshi. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you so much, uh, Anissa. And uh, Lisa's in the background there uh, managing all of our tech. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here. If you had told me at the age of 20 uh, or when I was 30 or when I was 40 that someday I would be an author, a full-time author, and would be writing a trilogy, I would have laughed because that wasn't something that was in the cards for me. Uh, it wasn't something I spent my lifetime dreaming about. And I wasn't one of those people who always uh, carried around a little book and wrote little stories or even kept a journal. I'm just not one of those people. I really thought I was going to be an artist. That was my thing. I was drawing. I was sketching. I was always wanting to do art. When I went to get my first uh, job in advertising, I wanted to be an art director because I thought I was going to be drawing all the little storyboards. And it turned out, no, they said, you are a better writer. <laughs> so we're going to hire you as a writer. So I sort of got pushed into writing. I'm an accidental writer. But somewhere along 2008, I had been running my own advertising and marketing agency for a while. And uh, my husband is the one who kept saying to me, I think you can uh, write much longer form stories. I know that you write these little stories, you write commercials, you write radio spots, and you write these uh, advertising campaigns and marketing campaigns, but I think you can write long form fiction. And I just sort of poo-pooed the idea because I thought, no, 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 you know, I'm just a hack. Uh, I don't do like serious literature or anything. And he said, well, why don't you just, you know, take a class every now and then? I started to take a couple of classes. And then what happened is that in 2008, there is this mortgage crisis looming over our heads. And at that time, I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, I've been through a couple of recessions before in my uh, business. And what happens is it lasts about two years solid that my business kind of goes down or people sort of uh, scale back on their projects. And so I thought, okay, this time, what am I going to do with my two years? Sometimes I travel, sometimes I read books. You know, my life hasn't always been about working, working, working. It's about sort of balancing out work and then doing other things. So I thought in these two years, why don't I take my husband up on the thing that he's been suggesting to me all of this time? And I am going to enter a master's program in creative writing. It's exactly a two-year program, perfect timing. So at the same time that I'm doing all this, my younger brother is buying a condo in Jaipur. We used to live in Jaipur in the state of Rajasthan at one time. And we, were, uh, we also have all this extended family there. So we don't go to India without also then stopping in Jaipur. 
up for? Well, he bought this condo just for my parents because they were in their 70s or getting more nostalgic. And he said, you know, you guys, if you want to go and visit friends and family, no better time to do it than now. And here are the keys to the condo. You can stay for as long as you'd like. So, you know, my mom said to me, let's go. And this is all around the time that I'm starting this program. So mom and I are going off to Jaipur. I would uh, travel around with her for a little while, hang out, and then I would go back and start my first semester. And then she would stay for a little bit longer. I would come back at the end of my semester and pick her up and then take her back home. And we made this trip about four or five times during my program because I had, you know, so many breaks. I had a summer break and a Christmas break and all of that. So we make this trip and I am seeing Jaipur through my mother's eyes. So for the first time as an adult, I'm hanging out with my mom. I have not been with her since I was 18 years old and left for college. I've not lived home since then. And all of a sudden I am like hanging out with mom and we're going to the Pink City Bazaar uh, and we're going to the fruit shops and places where mom is saying, oh, there's that fruit. It's called bale. I can't get it in the United States, but that is my favorite fruit. It always was my favorite fruit. And then, uh, you know, we go to the city palace uh, for a tour and we have kulfi outside. It's a hot day. And my mother remembers the time that she had had an audience with the Maharani who liked to meet the wives of the families who were all going abroad as we were in 1967 when my father decided to get a doctorate. So we're off doing that. And then at, at one point, we hired a car and we drove all the way to Agra, which is about six hours away. Uh, that's where, of course, the Taj Mahal is located. And Irene, I see that your background is the Taj Mahal. Yay. <laughs> Um, so uh, we went there to look at the Taj Mahal, but also to visit my mom's old school, which is something that, um, you know, for some reason, she and her brother, the next uh, child in line, they were educated in Agra and went to school in Agra for most of their young lives. Uh, while um, my grandfather, who was a, a magistrate, he, he kept getting moved around and getting transferred. So he would take the younger children uh, with them everywhere. So we went to Agra. We went to my mother's old school. We met the current headmistress. It was really fun. And then my mother remembered that when she was 18, this was her first year in college. She was studying psychology. She would love to have kept studying psychology, except that my grandfather called her and said, we have found this young, promising engineer for you to marry. It is time for you to come home. So mom goes home. She is a dutiful, well brought up young Indian woman. She does what her parents tell her to do. Now she sees my father from across the room. Uh, she has never talked to him and does not even talk to him that day that she meets him because there's so many people milling around the room who want to know who are these two people who are getting uh, hooked up. And then the next time she sees dad, they are actually uh, going uh, walking seven times around the fire to seal their fate for seven lifetimes and they are married. And then in four short years, mom has three children. Uh, she never returns to school. She doesn't uh, have a career of her own. Basically, she is, uh, you know, catering either to the three of us kids or to my dad or uh, to the many places that we keep moving to because my father is a young and promising engineer and he is getting uh, uh, sent around to different cities to either be promoted or transferred or work on a whole new project. So my dad is one of those engineers in the 1950s in India who was helping rebuild India. And that formed a lot of my information about what uh, India was like in the 1950s, which is when I start this novel. But also what I'm noticing as mom is sharing her young life with me is that my mother never had the kind of choices that she has always afforded me. So she said to me, you will make your own choice about your partner. You will make your own choice about your career. You will make your own choice about your family, whether you're going to have children, how many you're going to have. You get to make all those choices because I didn't get to make them. But one thing for sure, I know you must have a way to support yourself financially before you get married. And that way, your future options will be open to you. All right. So, you know, I took her message to heart and I really, uh, you know, I loved working. So so it was it was a no brainer for me to follow her advice and do all of that. But I realized 
you know, maybe my mother would have liked to have the same life that I did. Maybe this is why she set me up the way that she did for a more independent life. What if, as I am writing here in my program and I'm trying to write a novel, what if I create a character who is doing exactly what I think my mother would have liked to do. She leaves her marriage uh, after two years, but before children are born, when it's, it would have been too uh, impossible to leave. And she forges a life of her own and she navigates the patriarchy on her own terms. So this is where Lakshmi, the henna artist is born. That is the genesis of where this whole thing started. And what is so remarkable about all of this, I'm going to move ahead a little bit and just let you know that the henna artist is, uh, has been sold into 31 territories and is being translated into 26 languages. Because this is not just a story about a woman in India. This is about an every woman's story. This is a story about women's agency, whether they get to have it, they don't get to have it, who gets to have it, how much of it do they get to have. And my firm belief that every woman in this world deserves to make the choices that are going to determine her destiny. So that whole story started with my mother. All right, so I'm moving forward with a henna artist. It only took me less than a year to really come up with the actual story. But what I'm really learning to do is how do you sustain tension? How do you um, move a story arc with so many characters so that you are uh, you as a reader can follow along what is going on and not lose interest? That's really the crux of what you're trying to do when you learn how to write a novel. And uh, in my early drafts of the henna artist, uh, it becomes my thesis. Uh, I know I still have a lot of work to do, but I present it as my thesis at the end of two years. And this was in 2011. My mother is present. I introduce her as my muse. Everything's hunky-dory. And um, But then within a year of that presentation, my mother dies. It was very unexpected. And I thought, Wow. Okay. So I wrote this book. It was for my mother. It started with my mother and Lakshmi is sort of a stand in for my mother. Now, what do I do? Maybe I just don't do anything with this novel. It's not meant to go forward. Maybe I'll do something else. And I put the book away. And by now the recession has uh, calmed down. Uh, clients are calling. They want some work. Uh, they're resuming some projects. So I just get right back to work. Two years go by. And my thesis advisor calls me and says, hey, Alka, what happened to that novel that you were working on? So I explained to her what had happened and I put the whole thing away. And she said, you know what, let's work on it. And, uh, you know, maybe working through some of the stuff that you still need to work on in the novel is a good way to sort of go through the grief process, right? So we work on it together for about a year and a half. And then she sends it to her agent. Next thing I know, Emma Sweeney is calling me from New York saying, hey, I love this novel. I love Lakshmi. I love everything about the henna artist. And I've been to Jaipur because there's a literary festival there every January. And I've represented several of my author clients there. So I know exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about Jaipur. Let's work on this. So I think, wow, I didn't even have to go look for a literary agent. This is amazing. Like, how often does that happen? And I'm going to get published. And Emma said, not so fast. No, you still have some work to do on this novel. Now, for the next three years, I'm talking one year, two year, three years, Emma and I are editing this novel. She is telling me to uh, cut out every other chapter. She's telling me to add backstory, to remove backstory, to make some scenes more compelling and so on. Finally, at the end of three years, I say, Emma, when are we ever going to send this off to a publisher? And she said, oh, well, gosh, I'm a literary agent. I can't tell you that. You need to get yourself a professional editor. So I go find myself a developmental editor. That's what they're called. And I have one who is lovely, Sandra Schofield. She teaches at the Iowa Workshop every summer uh, in Iowa. And um, she just gives me lovely, lovely, lovely suggestions and a lot of great positive reinforcement. Um, but I think, hmm, I, I, I wonder if Sandra uh, understood what I wanted to do with this novel. Why would she have me uh, consider so many changes? So then I think, I'm going to send it off to another editor. I do send it off to another editor. This time it's Ronit Wagman. And Ronit looks at, at the novel and she also sends me back 15 pages of ideas and suggestions and so on. And at this point, I just lost it because I thought, wait a second, why am I 
having to make all of these changes. Uh, it's been seven years since I started this project. Uh, if it came out of my imagination, and this is fiction out of my imagination, why is it that everybody else gets to tell me what to do with this novel? I give up. I'm not meant to be a writer. I'm not meant to put this novel out. I'm not going to do it anymore. So I put it away. Another year goes by and I am working. I'm looking in my desk for something and I reach in. I find this uh, manuscript. <laughs> And I, uh, you know, it's just like one of those things you're, you're curious and uh, you start reading something that that you have written. Maybe it's a uh, sweater that you knit a while ago and you're looking at it thinking, wow, I knit this sweater. That's how I was looking at this manuscript. Oh, gosh, I wrote this 350 page novel and I start reading it. And an hour later, I'm still reading and I'm thinking, hey, this is a pretty good story. I mean, it's like I forget that I even wrote this novel. I think I like Lakshmi. I want to know what's happening with Lakshmi. I want to know what's happening with Radha and with Kant. I, I'm interested. So I thought, OK, let me go back and look at some of those uh, uh, editorial comments again. And I look at them. And essentially, because I've had a year's distance from all of those comments, now I can actually hear them for what they are. What these women are telling me is that this novel will definitely get published. It has everything you need. It just needs to be tighter. And if I can just make some of these comments uh, uh, come alive on the page, the comments that they've given me, then it could be a bestseller. So I thought, OK, I can get to work on that. I'd work on it. Another year and a half goes by. Of course, I'm working to pay my bills at the same time, but another year and a half goes by and I finally send it off to Emma again. I say, Emma, remember me? I haven't talked to you in three years, but I'm hoping you still want to be my agent. Um, will you please look this over? And I've done exactly what you said. I got myself, uh, you know, an editor. I got myself two editors and I have, you know, twice the work that I put into this. And I'm really hoping that you'll send it off to a publisher. She does. Within two months, we have a contract. The contract is from Mira Books, which is a division of HTP Books, which is a division of HarperCollins. Now, this is what happens to an author after they get a contract. There's about 18 months to two years to go before you are actually going to see the book in a library or at a bookstore. And during that time, you are working with your new editor at the publishing house. In my case, it's Kathy. Kathy has suggestions that she would like me to make. She has some major character changes that she would like me to make. So I'm going to I'm going to do that. And uh, at the same time, the art department is working on a fabulous cover. And this is the cover that they came up with, which I just fell in love with right away when I saw it. Uh, this is the Jaipur Palace. This woman coming out could be Lakshmi coming out after one of her meetings with the Maharani's. The marketing department has said, you know, Alka, you gave us a title uh, for the book and we're just not sure about it. I think we'd really like to call it the henna artist if, if it's all the same to you, <laughs> because um, and this is where I have to confess to you, I am lousy with titles. I am not a good title person. So don't ever ask me to title a book. So um, they call it the henna artist because they say it telegraphs immediately what the book is about. Fine. Uh, the sales department at HarperCollins and Mirror Books, they are doing an amazing job selling this book because HarperCollins has had me go out to New York. They've had me go out to Toronto. They have me talk to a book, the biggest bookseller up in Canada. They have me uh, doing all kinds of, um, you know, radio interviews and things like that. And it was just a wonderful a uh, way for me to sort of get used to the idea that they had expected The Henna Artist to be a really big book for 2020. So that sales department has sold it everywhere. They have sold it into all the independent bookstores, into all of the, the libraries and the um, Amazon and Target and Walmart and the Indigo stores and Barnes and Noble, everything. And everybody is just waiting for the release date to put the book up on the shelves. The release date, which was set, remember, 18 months ago, was March the 10th, 2020. On March the 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a global pandemic. One by one, every single book launch event is canceled. Every book signing is canceled. Every conference is canceled. Panel discussion is canceled. Every bookstore starts closing down. Every library starts closing down. And I just think to myself, 
shoot me now. Just shoot me now. <laughs> what have I spent the last 10, 12 years of my life working on? I won't get to talk to one reader. I let myself wallow in self-pity for a couple of days. And then I said, yeah, you have to get back on the horse. I mean, there's no, there's no uh, alternative. You just have to do it. You just have to do it in these kinds of situations. So I thought, okay, what can I do? I can let people know that I am here at home just like they are in lockdown. And they can contact me for their book clubs because I love talking to readers. I really need to talk to readers. I want to talk to them about my book. And I put the word out on social media. I'm here. Please call me. To date, I have done 410 book clubs in the last year. And it's all because I really needed to talk to people <laughs> because I couldn't go anywhere. And I have enjoyed it so much because every single book club has allowed me to go into 10, 15, 8, 6 living rooms. And I get to see what people uh, have on the walls. I get to see their furniture. I get to talk to them about you know, um, how they're faring during COVID. It's been really lovely to make that personal connection with all of those readers. So then uh, I get a call from my editor while we're doing all of this. And she said, I hope you're gonna sit down because I have some news. And I thought, oh my God, more bad news. <laughs> this is just gonna kill me. And she said, Reese Witherspoon is going to announce your book as her May 1st book pick uh, for 2020. And you could have, you could have just tilted me with a feather. I mean, it was so uh, unexpected and it was completely stunning to have something like that happen because after everything, after all the stops, after all the starts and then all the ups and all the downs, this is the last thing that I thought might happen. And then for the next four weeks, what I'm doing is working with Hello Sunshine, Reese's uh, book club people, and we are putting together uh, social media. Uh, you know, a year prior, my editor had had the foresight to tell me, please get on social media, learn how to use social media. And I had. And one of the more beautiful things about social media was that when you have a visual book like The Henna Artist, where you can talk about what Jepper looks like, what the food looks like, the colors of uh, the walls of people's houses and their saris and um, all the patterns of the henna, when it's so visual, it makes it really easy to do social media. And I loved doing it. I had really gotten into the whole social media thing. So um, I give the Hello Sunshine people all this uh, idea for social media and I start populating all of this stuff. And then we do a couple of cooking videos, which was really fun for me because uh, it was like I was uh, with my mother in the kitchen. You know, she was like watching over me. And um, and then let's see. Oh, and then I had my older brother, Madhup, do a Maharani cocktail for me for the older Maharani who likes to water her orchids with gin and tonics. Uh, and uh, he's our mixologist in the family. So that was really fun. Uh, and of course, my dad, my brothers, my husband, you know, everybody is um, helping with um, social media ideas and things like that. So it was really, really fun. And then finally, May 1st arrives. And now Reese and I are doing our Zoom chat. And um, I just am so impressed with this 45-year-old woman who has turn the publishing industry on its head. You know, historically in the publishing world, if, uh, if a publisher had like this much of a promotion uh, budget, they would put this much of it towards male authors and this much of it towards female authors. And it was just a gender bias that had existed forever in the industry. And Reese Witherspoon thought, well, you know, there's all of these books that are written by females that have a strong female at the center whom I just adore. I love these books. And I tell my friends about them all the time. Why don't they get the full page ads in the New York Times? Why don't they get these kinds of uh, opportunities that the male authors do? So she thought, what if, what if I use my influence to make that happen? And that's exactly what she did just four short years ago. Four years ago is when she started Hello Sunshine. And now when you look at the New York Times bestseller list, you'll see at least four or five of her selections on that list. That is the influence and power of Reese. It's been amazing. So I get to talk to this woman, which is amazing. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I was going to have a heart attack, but I actually kind of like, you know, uh, got 
acclimated, you know, the, the longer we talked, it was fine. Now, at the same time that Reese and I are talking, it was really amazing that the bookstores had started to ship out books. Amazon has started to ship out books. Amazon has finally stopped just shipping out toilet paper and bath soap. They are shipping out books again. And so are Barnes and Noble and Kepler's and City Lights and, you know, everybody is starting to ship out books, which is fabulous. And those people who couldn't get access to, to uh, the physical book, they start buying it on ebooks and on um, audiobooks. And I had so much fun choosing the narrator for the audiobook and working with her to do the audiobook because she did an amazing, amazing job. She took us to the New York Times bestseller list in audiobooks. And within one month, we are on all of the bestseller lists the New York Times, the LA Times, USA Today, Toronto Star, everything. And now, the movie companies start calling. That's how fast things move now. So the movie companies are calling and I'm like, help. So I asked my uh, literary agency, I said, what do I do? And they said, okay, we have a uh, agency we're gonna contract to in Hollywood called the Gotham Group. And it is run by a fabulous woman named uh, Ellen Goldsmith Vane. And she's the CEO and she asked me, Alka, do you see the henna artist as a, uh, as a movie or as a TV series? How do you see it? And I said, oh, well, hands down. I actually, when I was writing it, I saw it as a TV series because there's so many characters and each of the, each of the characters has sort of a plot line or a storyline that we're following. And I am addicted to bingeable shows where I can follow multiple characters, episode after episode and season after season. And um, I, I, I cannot help myself. I try to I try to tell myself, OK, I'm just going to watch one episode tonight. And then I end up watching another episode and an episode after that, an episode after that until my eyes are bleary. So I said, I want this to be a TV series and a streaming series that is just like hard to put down. So she said, OK. So she told everybody who was interested, the author would like a TV series. And those are the kind of proposals that we got back. So I'm looking over all these proposals. They're like 35, 40 pages long. I don't know how to judge any of them, but I do have a chance to zoom in with all the production teams. And each of them has a major actress tied to the, that particular project. Um, and uh, I ended up choosing the team of Michael Edelstein, who had been in charge of NBC Universal Studios in London at the time that Downton Abbey was getting filmed. And he was very much responsible for making sure that that became a global enterprise. And when he read The Henna Artist, he said, oh, my God, I can see this being an Indian Downton Abbey. That's how we're going to play this, because it could be that lush. And we have the upstairs, downstairs of Downton Abbey happening in The Henna Artist. We also have um, all these threads of colonialism and, um, uh, uh, you know, casteism and colorism. And uh, we have the interplay between all these different people. And we have, you know, there's so much tension in this book. We could totally make this an Indian Downton Abbey. He sends the manuscript to his friend, um, uh, Frida Pinto. Uh, and Frida says, oh my God, I love this book. Okay, I'm on board. Can I be Lakshmi? Yes, you can be Lakshmi. And also she wants to executive produce uh, the, the novel because she wants to get into executive production. Okay, great. And then Michael has a first look deal with Miramax TV. So now Miramax is on board. So um, right now what's happening since I signed on the dotted line is they are in pre-production, which means they are trying to figure out, um, they have a showrunner, they are um, you know, putting together pilot episodes. They're you know, trying to figure out, uh, I'm sure eventually they'll get to a crew and a casting and all of that kind of stuff. And then hopefully by, you know, COVID notwithstanding, uh, hopefully by late 2022, early 2023, uh, we might be filming. Uh, and of course, it'll be in India. So that's going to be really fun. Now, at the same time that we put the henna artist to bed, which is uh, essentially when it gets sent off to the printer a couple of months uh, before it shows up on bookshelves, I started working on book number two. Now, I didn't know I was going to be doing a sequel until Malik, one of the main characters in the henna artist, he has loomed so large in my imagination from the moment he showed up that he kept saying, I have a story to tell. 
I have a story to tell. <laughs> you have to tell my story. And it was it was that prompting by a character uh, who has become part of my sort of um, my imaginative family in my head uh, that prompted me to write The Secret Keeper of Jaipur. And this book is coming out uh, in June 22nd, on June 22nd. And uh, uh, it is the story of Malik is a 20 year old. He is down in Jaipur on an apprenticeship at the Jaipur Palace, learning about construction and so on. And uh, Lakshmi has sent him down there, much to the chagrin of Malik's beloved uh, uh, Himalayan tribal woman up in the Shimla area. And Malik, um, discovers some nefarious things that are going on with the construction. And of course, he's gonna meet up again with the Maharanis, both of them. He's gonna meet up with the Singhs uh, and uh, Ravi and Sheila who are now married. Uh, he, you know, there's a lot, there's some new characters that you're going to be introduced to. Uh, but, uh, as he is trying to figure out how he's going to handle this, um, the you know how he's going to divulge the secrets that he is running into, uh, he has to, of course, enlist Lakshmi's help to do that. Uh, but he's also trying to make it um, comfortable for all the people he loves to survive this scandal uh, that he has unearthed. So that's what's happening in book number two. And then immediately, as I was writing book number two, I go, okay, I know what book number three now has to be. And that has to be about Radha being an adult. She's 30 years old. She's in Paris. She's a perfumer. She got married to a Frenchman who was traveling through the Himalayas. She has two little girls. Um, she's really excited. She's happy. Uh, she has the family she always wanted. She's on the cusp of designing a signature scent for her master perfumer when there is a knock on the door and somebody she hasn't seen in 18 years from the henna artist is on the other side of that door. So that's the book I'm writing now, book number three. <laughs> so um, it's it's been a very busy uh, two years, <laughs> I have to say. So anyway, now I would just love to take um, any kind of questions that you guys might have about the writing process, about you know anything that's happening in uh, any of these books. Oh, I should also mention you guys that the Henna Artist paperback came out on April the 6th of this year. Paperbacks usually come out about a year after the hardcover comes out. And uh, we made the New York Times bestseller list already two weeks in a row after the paperback came out. So that's really cool. All right, you guys. Who's got a question for me? <laughs> We're happy to unmute you or you can <clears throat> place your question in chat. I see you have fans out here uh, uh, in the chat if you haven't seen it. Ah, wonderful. Look at this. Lots of people giving the love and the, um, yes, an amazing story. Um, I always am like, I don't like historical fiction. I don't like family dramas. I don't, and then I'm like, oh my God, I need book two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see that Irene has a question here. How has your book been received in India? All right, Irene, I'm so glad that you asked this question because um, I think I wanted to answer this also for the uh, Asian American Pacific Islander audience. You know, when you write a book and you don't live in that country anymore, do you have a right to write that book? Um, do other people think you have the right? Do How do you make sure that it feels authentic to the people who are actually from that country? Um, so I was very concerned about all of these things before the, the henna artist came out. And I thought, oh, no, you know, what if they hate it? What if they hate it? But I tried everything I could to make the henna artist as authentic as possible. And that meant doing so much research. That is what a historical fiction author does. Lots and lots of research. I read a lot of books uh, that took place during that time written by Indian authors. I uh, watched a lot of movies. Uh, I watched a lot of movies that were taking place uh, in 1960s, in 1950s, and 1940s to get a, a breath of all of that. Um, you know, there are phenomenal uh, Indian writers like Tagore and uh, Narayan, and you know, there's all kinds of Indian writers. The Sai, uh, they are wonderful um, to, to read even today. It's all relevant today. I also talked to lots of people who are still alive because, uh, you know, independence wasn't that long ago. And so uh, there are still people alive who can answer a lot of these questions for me. So I made it so authentic 
And now the question that I'm asked by South Asians who are either living in India or in Pakistan or in Bangladesh or in Sri Lanka, or even across the diaspora globally is, you haven't lived in India since you were nine. How did you get this so right? So that is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful comment to get from all kinds of folks. And I think uh, one of the more touching comments that I get is from women who say, you got this right. This could have been my story. What happened to Lakshmi was my mother's story. What happened to Lakshmi was my grandmother's story. And so it's giving women a lot of, um, I think, sort of this deep knowledge of maybe the history of women in that era, history of their own mothers and grandmothers. And also, I think it's giving young women today um, this uh, notion of a nation that has progressed a lot in some ways, but maybe not so much in others, especially maybe when it comes to gender rights. So that is how I would answer your question. Thank you, Irene. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, do you have a comment? Candy Norland says, do you have a comment about the caste system which underpins your story? Um, you know, I wish that the caste system did not exist, but I think that uh, like the concept of a nuclear family, the, the um, caste system is going to be very difficult to eradicate in India. It has been around for centuries and centuries and millennia, millennia, millennia. So um, it started off as a way to delineate jobs. Okay, so if you are a teacher, you're a Brahmin. If you're a spiritual guru, you're a Brahmin. Uh, if you are in the army and you're guarding the fort and your rulers, then you are in the warrior caste, uh, you know, and on down the line. So um, I think at some point that idea of the jobs um, being delineated like that turned into more of a class system. So somehow the people who were Brahmins and warriors um, started to be uh, sort of a, a higher uh, class uh, to, sort of people than uh, or perceived as higher class than others, especially the ones who were doing the laundry or uh, lighting the funeral pyres. So um, I wish that it didn't exist. And in 2019, when I went to India, I went to also find out from young people how they're feeling about the caste system. And what I found is that a lot of people in the middle class, and the middle class in India has grown substantially in the last 20, 30 years, huge, huge, huge change uh, for the middle class, uh, so that we have a lot more wealthy people in the middle class who can afford to send both their uh, daughter and their son to school. Uh, college and then to higher education beyond that. But um, what's happening now is that those women who are going to college and, you know, meeting people of all different castes and all different classes, you know, they're able to say, you know, caste doesn't matter to me. Caste is not important. And then I ask them, are you going to have an arranged marriage? And 70 to 80 percent of marriages in India are still being arranged by family. And they might say, yes, my family will decide uh, my partner for me. And then I ask, so are they going to look outside of your caste? And the answer is no, because that generation of people has grown up uh, wanting to have a family that their daughter or son will marry into, who is also going to celebrate the same uh, rituals, uh, eat the same food, speak the lame, same dialect. Uh, raise their children the same way. So they're very concerned about want, wanting to maintain their tradition. Um, and so this is one reason why they um, parents uh, insist on the same cast. Now, I did run across women who say, I've fallen in love with another guy. He is, uh, he is not somebody that my parents would have picked out for me because he's from a different class or a different cast, but it doesn't matter to me. And I've talked to my parents about it and I'm going to marry him. So that is also happening. Love marriages are on the rise. Whereas in my parent in my parents' time, you know, when they were married in 1955, it might have been maybe 5% love marriages. Now it's more like 20, 30%. Um, now, along with this, I have to tell you also that um, divorce is on the rise. So as women, just the same as it happened here in the United States, when women started joining the workforce and having their own income, they also then have a voice. They have a voice at home. They have a voice that says, 
I don't have to do the cooking, cleaning, laundry, and bring home the bacon. So, um, you know, somebody's got to help out. And uh, if if the uh, if her partner is not willing to make that uh, make that change in their life, then divorce abounds. So in India, the divorce rates are going up. More so than that, I had this wonderful book club on uh, Sunday. And it was all of these Indian women in India. They're all working professional women. And uh, they, what they told me is happening now with young women who are making an income that is even more than their husbands are making. Um, they are getting prenup agreements before they, uh, you know, in their arranged marriages, they are asking for prenup agreements. And also, <laughs> I thought this is just hilarious. Um, uh, a lot of them, you know, will just say, look, um, we're not going to give you a dowry, you know, a groom's family. We're not going to give you a dowry because the dowry was meant to protect women, uh, you know, and say, look, our son will take care of you for the rest of your life. So your family has to give us uh, gold and jewelry and, that, and money and you know, all of that kind of stuff. And these young women are saying, nobody has to take care of me. I can take care of myself. So we're going to forego the dowry. So I think that these are all positive steps toward a more um, liberated India, uh, an India that might be liberated from the caste system, from the dowry system, and um, hopefully uh, a system that recognizes women, uh, you know, and their agency more. Thank you for your question. Um, Okay, Libby says, yes, even though I'm not a Southeast Asian, it's a woman's story. Thank you, Libby. Absolutely true. Um, all right. What program? Oh, Adriana Philpot says, what a great name, Adriana Philpot. I love it. Um, okay, what program was helpful for starting your writing and who did you get feedback from in the beginning? Do you have any words of wisdom for new writers to improve their writing? Yes, I do, <laughs> Adriana. One of the first things that I tell new writers is study with a teacher uh, whose work you admire and study with a teacher whose work has been published in the last five to 10 years. Because if they've been published in the last five years, let's say, they are more in touch with what's happening in the publishing industry. Their uh, agent will be more in touch with uh, work that they can send off to a publisher. So number three, study with somebody who is writing something similar to what you're writing. So for example, if you're writing fiction and it's let's say historical fiction, like I was writing, please study with somebody who has written historical fiction. Uh, if you are writing, uh, you know, they don't have to be the only person you're studying with, but please make sure that you study with somebody like that. Uh, if you are doing a memoir, make sure you study with somebody who is an excellent memoirist and whose book has been published and, you know, uh, to acclaim. So study like, like, right? So study somebody who is doing something like you are writing. Um, and then also, uh, it takes a village to write a book. Please do not ever think that you have to write your book all by yourself. Please, please, please do not put that kind of pressure on yourself. There are so many people who will help you. Your, um, your teachers in your uh, MFA programs. I got my MFA program at CCA, which is a California College of Arts in San Francisco. It was a great program because they had working instructors, you know, instructors who had recently been published. It was very important for me to go to a program like that and uh, to learn from them. And as it turned out, it was my instructor, Anita Amirazvani, who sent off my book to her agent. And that's how I got my agent. So very, very worth it for me. Um, the reason that I did an MFA program is because I wanted two year intensive learning how to write a novel, learning how to write um, good scenes, learning how to write dialogue. You know, I took a whole bunch of different classes so that I could learn how to write all of those things. But in the meanwhile, I always made Anita my mentor. Uh, we got to choose a mentor every semester. And so she, I worked with her one-on-one -on, -one on the novel. Okay, um, so what else can I tell you about um, programs? You need to invest in yourself. If you think it's too expensive to invest in yourself, then, uh, then let's deal with that first. 
you deserve to do something that is going to meet your heart where your mind is. You deserve to do the thing that is inside you, that butterfly that wants to come out. You deserve it. Invest in yourself. Don't think about, oh gosh, it's going to be like $5,000 if I do this or $3,000 if I do that, or this class is $350 or uh, you know whatever. Please just know that you are worth it. You are worth investing money in yourself. Maybe you skip a couple of haircuts. Maybe uh, your child does not get to have that fabulous Rivendale bike that they have been salivating over. You keep that money for yourself, ladies, because you deserve it. <laughs> so, um, so that's what I would say to you. And then let other people help you make that book better. It, um, if I hadn't listened to my literary agent, I would have been uh, so much farther behind in getting this book into a publisher's hand. If I hadn't listened to all those editors that I had had, I would have been so much farther behind. Listen to the people who know what they're doing. I would not be where I am today if I hadn't listened to all of those people who are much more expert in the publishing and writing world than I am. Okay, so thank you, Adriana, for your question. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Um, I know, I know, I know we have other questions here, so <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to find them. I, I can jump in and read one to you if you. Thank you. Help. Thank you. Um, did you begin with the intention of writing a trilogy or did it evolve organically after completing The Hidden Artist? It evolved organically, just like the story evolved organically. I never know what's going to happen at the beginning when I start a story. So for me, my stories have to go like this. I start with a scene. Then another scene will come to me and then another scene and another scene. And then I have to figure out some way to weave these scenes together. So for me, it's like threading a necklace and all these scenes, the major scenes are like beads. And I never know how that necklace is going to be. What's, what's the fastener at the end of the necklace? I don't know until I get to the end of my story, until I've written the whole thing out. Ah, now I can go back and start revising and revising and revising. The henna artist, the book that you're reading today is the 30th draft of my book. <laughs> so take heart. If you think you've done like five drafts and you think you've done way more than you need to, take heart. It will take time to get everything right. This is a new, um, maybe this is a new um, sort of craft for you. And it's just like if you're learning to knit or you're learning to sew or you're learning to garden, it's going to take a lot of trial and error before you get to the point where you're really good at what you're doing. Um, did I answer the question, uh, uh, Anissa, or uh, was there? I think you did. I, I did not have the question, but I think that's a lovely um, analogy of the necklace. And somebody definitely mentioned that there too Yeah. in the chat. Oh. And Yes, that's right. That's right. It started off with, did I know it was going to be a, um, a trilogy? No. So just like that, I didn't know it was going to be a trilogy at all. All those years that I spent working on the henna artist, I was really just trying to get really good at one novel. I didn't want to like start all over again with another idea. I just want, I had this one idea. I wanted my mother's life to be reimagined. And uh, so that was my goal. Make sure that your intention for whatever it is you're writing is coming from somewhere deep within you because that's going to resonate with readers. You know, don't write a story just because everybody else is writing about, let's say, um, their, their way of dealing with a pandemic. Please don't. My agent told me that she receives 100 stories a day about the pandemic. Enough already. She's not reading anymore. <laughs> so, so, I mean, don't join a bandwagon work on something, deliver something from your heart that means a lot to you, because that will take you all the way to the finish line. It's wonderful. Um, there's now there's just a lot of like, thank you for all this uh, work that you've done and your um, gifted storytelling. Carmen says that you took uh, her vicariously back to Jaipur. Oh. Um, and then there was, I loved this comment. Let me see. It's very up at the top. Oh, yes. Congratulations on all your success. Persistence pays off. Loved the book, especially Malik and Auntie Boss. <laughs> so I love when people connect to the characters and you have just set it up so lovely to flow into a trilogy. Oh, it's been 
It's been lovely, you guys. And, you know, um, I want to give a shout out to the San Francisco Public Library because uh, I think that most of us authors were readers before we were writers. And we were the kind that just pu put our noses into books. And maybe we were too shy, like I was, to talk to people. So I just buried my nose in books all the time. And uh, what's lovely is that all of that pays off. You know, if you are a shy kid and you did read a lot, someday you might grow up to be a writer because all of that is now in your DNA and you are able to um, spew it out in a, in, a, in a way that is just yours in a, in a customized way. So um, thank you, San Francisco Public Library for holding things like this and also um, you know, giving all of us the opportunity to talk to one another, uh, authors and readers. So wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. There's somebody here, um, Stans. Oh, this is a wonderful, um, this seems like a Dutch name. Is it Stans uh, Kleinen? Kleinen. I love the book. I lived in India, Mumbai recently and can so relate to the stories. I could not put it down. Thank you. My goodness, this is so great. That is what uh, all of us authors want. We want to create a book that nobody can put down. This is so, so, so important. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Is it yes, Stans? it is a Dutch name, Stans Kleinen. I was actually a Dutch diplomat in India. So oh. I just love the book. Fantastic. I've already signed up for the Secret Keeper of Jaipur. So please Thank keep you. keep writing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Namrata says... Thank you so much to Alka and SFPL for this wonderful talk and connect. I live in India and I love how India has represented the country and our culture. Oh, can I just say this one last thing, um, Anissa? Is that okay? Yeah, of course. So, so this, I, this I really want to say to the uh, AAPI audience. Um, I, when I came here as an immigrant, I was nine years old and we moved to Iowa. And nobody in Iowa had ever met anybody from India before, certainly not in Ames, Iowa, where we landed. And so I would get the weirdest questions as a kid. I'm the only brown kid in all of my classes. And the questions I'm being asked are things like, why do you worship cows? Well, I personally don't worship cows. I don't know what people are talking about. And then they would ask me things like, um, you know, do you sleep on a bed or do you sleep on the floor? And I was like, oh, well, of course I sleep in a bed. Do you know how to use cutlery? Uh, yeah, I know how to use cutlery. So the questions that I was being asked, uh, what are you doing about all the poor people in India? They really threw me because I understood uh, in a very short period of time that what people were saying to me was that India was a backwards place. It was underdeveloped. It was a third world country. Uh, they had no idea that anybody read or, um, you know, they, they only knew a single story about India. And that was that India was poor and illiterate. So, you know, I come from the middle class, so I could not reconcile those two worlds in my own head. And I decided, okay, I'm just going to be American. I'm just going to do everything American. I'm going to talk American. I'm going to wear my jeans and T-shirts. And uh, I'm just going to pretend I'm not Indian, which is hard to do with my name and my skin color. But, you know, I'm fooling myself thinking, OK, I'm, I'm so American. It wasn't until I started traveling with my mom to India and seeing it through her eyes that I realized, oh, my God. I do come from a place that does have poverty, that does have illiteracy, that has classism and colorism, but I also come from a land that is so gorgeous. I come from a land of full, filled with color, filled with people who are um, warm and inviting. I come from a land of resilience because these are people who were uh, dominated by the British for over 200 years, by Mughals for four or five centuries. Uh, they had all of these invaders coming through the North, all the European invaders looking for silks and spices and gold and all this kind of stuff. And yet the Indian people are still resilient. You know, they, they are still standing strong today, barring COVID, you know, most recently. But uh, initially they handled COVID in the most wonderful way possible. Modi did the most wonderful thing. He locked off the country for two months. But then, um, you know, he can't control all of the nation. Each state in the nation, just like in America, we have each state that makes their own rules. Each state started doing their own rules about, you know, opening up the border. So whatever. Anyway, uh, so what I got to do then what, as I was writing The Henna Artist is to talk about my love 
of my heritage. And I got to reclaim my heritage as a result of writing this over 10 years. I just think that that was one of the gifts that the book gave that back to me. You know, I thought I'm writing this book for my mother, but the book actually gave that back to me. Like I understand now that I am both East and West, and that is a beautiful combination. So if any of you guys out there have lived both in the East and the West, and you feel like, oh, I don't belong to either, that's okay, because you have the best of all worlds. You don't belong to either 100%, but you belong to both a little bit. And that is a beautiful place to write from. It's a beautiful perspective that you have because you have a distance uh, perspective and you also have the close-up perspective. So it's lovely. And I hope that all of you out there who are planning to write about whatever country you came from or whatever country uh, you know is in your heart, please do write about it because the world is hungry for uh, what your stories too. Oh, that was beautiful, Alka. Thank you so much. And uh, just, you know, and put it out there, the library does have writing groups, and we actually have one that is nurturing writers of color. So you can find that in our library website, or, you know, sometimes our website's not the most easiest, but just Google SFPL Writers Workshops, and you will find them. You Google anything SFPL, and you're going to find everything. <laughs> um, I think this was such a wonderful evening, and I am one putting in the chat a link to tomorrow's event, but also a link to tonight's event with how you can get um, the henna artist and book two, The Secret Keeper of Jeffrey. And they're both available. You, well, they're not available yet, but you can place a hold on The Secret Keeper. So <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. And um, thank you all so much for a wonderful evening. I am so glad we switched it over to meeting. And, it's, you know, I miss seeing all of you beautiful faces, even though a lot of you aren't from here. But SFPL community is spread wide. Alka, Joshi, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Anissa. Thank you, Lisa. Bye, guys.